So welcome to the Q&A video with regards to the subject of laser and these questions come to us from the department itself from uh, different past papers. So let's get started with some true or false. Let's get started with some true or false. So I really urge you to pause this video right away to try and uh, get these on your own and I do know that these are the same. Don't worry about that. So just pause this video and work on them. All right. Let's get started and see if we can make some sense of it all. Population inversion is necessary to produce light amplification in lasers. And, and really when you're talking about the minimals, this, this, is, this is in the minimal and the, uh, this is one of the two principles for getting light amplification in lasers, the other one being stimulated emission. So when you think about it, yes, yes it's, very, it's very necessary. We need that because we need to have most of the molecules in the excited state to get nice amplified uh, intense laser light. Very good. And now I want to read these two in concession because these two are essentially the same. They didn't come from the same exam, but I think they, uh, they're talking about the same thing, really. So lasers are known for their wide spectrum, and laser light is characterized by a wide wavelength spectrum. And if you stop and pause here for a second and think, well, I know that there are infrared lasers, I know that there are lasers, maybe red lasers, maybe blue, blue lasers, so they come in different different varieties. But what you need to keep in mind is that a blue laser will always be blue. Let's say a 400 or rather let's say a 300 nanometer nanometer light uh, laser is always going to be at this wavelength. It's, got, it's not going to be to have a range. It's not going to have a spectrum. It's not going to have a wide wavelength spectrum. It's going to be it's going to be monochromatic. Monochromatic. So this these two would be false. These two would be false. We're going to move on. Laser material must be a solid, cannot be gas or fluid. And this is just looking at the presentations that are really quite useful and saying, hey, I've seen CO2 laser indicated there. So this must be incorrect. This must be incorrect. All right, let's move on. The continuous mode of lasers produce higher wattage power output than the pulsing mode. And really, the difference between pulsing mode and continuous mode is the time of application of the laser. It really does not instinctively relate to the wattage power that you would get, although this may have not been uh, revised in your lecture or your seminar. But you can, you, can just, uh, you can just look at direct energy weapons, which is basically uh, pulsed lasers that are weaponized for the military that have very high wattage power. So really, the pulse and continuous mode just pertain to the uh, length at which there is application and not really the power of the application itself. So I would say it is false. And let's take these two on. Lasers can be used to control bleeding. True. Right away. It can be uh, controlled to uh, maybe control coagulation. Coagulation. Maybe superficial coagulation or coagulation within the eye of diabetic patients. And these two are in the presentation and that's why I remember them. So you should really view the presentation. It's got some useful stuff. Stimulated emission means the emission of photons due to heat applied on the laser material. And this really is again from the from the lecture slide. We had this little this little thing where you had an electron and bounced off. And that electron was here, and now you saw this little photon coming in, and this electron maybe dropped down and emitted another photon. And really, this interaction this interaction is due to electromagnetic radiation. We need photons to create stimulated emission. There was, no, there was no indication of any thermal energy at all. And when we're talking about this sentence saying stimulated emission means the emission of photons due to heat, there's no thermal, thermal in, um, interaction in place, only electromagnetic or photons. So I would say this is false. Let's move on. Let's do yellow. Laser light has a longer coherence length than light from a conventional light source. And this right away should ring true because light is coherent through time and space more than conventional or, or spontaneous emission. So this should be true. This should be perceived as true right away. Very good. Let's move on. Let's move on. And maybe we have some essay questions. And these I just took just a straight copy paste from, uh, from an exam I've seen. And I'm not going to obviously write down the, uh, the essay question. I'm just going to to split them out and you can just uh, maybe 
uh, pause the video, copy him down if you're interested. So I'm just going to speak him out. First of all, I want you to maybe pause this video and try and think about how you answer those questions. Very good, let's get started. Compare stimulated and spontaneous emission. And really, stimulated emission is, uh, is for everyday, everyday regular emission. And this would be incoherent through time and space. It would be incoherent, incoherent through time and space. It would be less energetic, less energetic, energetic, eh, whatever. It's going to be non-polarized, non-polarized, and it's going to be polychromatic, polychromatic. And if you want to really uh, summarize the laser or the uh, the stimulated emission, all you do is you take this, you take this part, and you reverse it. So really, incoherent turns into coherent in time and space energetic and focused, polarized, and monochromatic. Very good. Explain why population inversion is necessary for lasing. Simply describing what it is is not sufficient. So what is population inversion and why do we, why do we need it for lasing? And we slightly touched on it. Population inversion is, is taking a population that has most of, it, of its molecules in a non-excited state into most of them being in an excited state. And why is this needed? Why is this needed? Because if I stimulate a populated in, or a population inverted space here, I'm going to get a more, more intense response. I'm going to get amplified, more photons, it's going to be more photon dense, more photon rich, and this is really my amplification. And if I don't have population inversion, let's just say I have this space where I only have two guys, I'm only going to I'm only going to really get two incident photons here, really. So there's no amplification here at this point. So this is why we need population inversion. Very good. Draw, and this is C, draw a three-level electronic energy system. And based on the figure, describe how population inversion and stimulated emission can be achieved. Indicate in the figure between which energy level stimulated emission and pumping takes place. All right. This seems maybe, maybe like a very long question, but it's rather simple. I have my three energy levels, three energy levels, and first of all, I need to cause a population inversion. So I'm going to do this, and I'm going to say pumping. This is just what I would do in the exam, pumping, and I would say population inversion, inversion can be achieved via, I'm just going to say, uh, maybe photons, maybe current, and then I have the electron, it's going to bounce up here, come down here, and then I'm just going to put this out and say, uh, uh, stimulation, stimulation. And this would write uh, photon or electromagnetic, doesn't really matter. And at this point, it comes down, and then I have my emission. And this is really, uh, this is really indicating how it can be achieved, how it can be achieved by a photon here, when it is going to take place, when it is going to take place, at what point. Really what we're looking at is that pumping is taking place when the molecule is at stable state, and stimulation is taking state where it's an intermediate level, kind of after it relaxed from this level here. This is where we have the stimulation to take place. Very good. Not too bad, hopefully. List at, three, at least three examples for the medical or biological application of lasers. I'm just going to list the first two that I can come up with. Eye surgery, eye surgery, and maybe um, bleeding, bleeding control, uh, coagulation, and stuff like that. This is just the two, the first two that got out in my mind. And you have quite a few in the lecture slides. You can look into it. Or uh, maybe photodynamic uh, therapy, etc., etc. So hopefully this video gave you a little bit of an idea of what you can expect and uh, maybe help you tackle some questions. Hopefully you found this helpful. See you in the next video.